Welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. I'm Cody, the digital pastor here. And right off the bat, uh, we need you to hear that we are a no matter church. But what that means is simply no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or even what's been done to you, uh, God loves you and you can look from here with us. You don't have to have it all figured out. Uh, you don't have to even believe everything that we believe. We're just really glad that you are here. And if you are new or even newer, I would love to connect with you 
hear your story, get to know you and send you a gift because we believe you matter to God and you matter to us. Uh, so if you take 30 seconds and fill out our welcome card, I'll send you an Amazon gift card here today. And you can get to that by clicking the link in the chat or texting PLC to 797979. What you can expect is I'll send you a text. Uh, just see how it can be praying for you. Uh, so just take a moment and fill it out right here in this moment. And a faith milestone that we celebrate here is child dedication. And child dedication is, is putting on display to uh, the church uh, that you're committing to raise your child in a godly home. And across all of our campuses, across Iowa, we are having those this weekend. Uh, so that is uh, just a great celebration. And if you wanna learn more about what that could look like for you, uh, I would love to answer those questions. And you can learn more by texting PLC to 797979. And the next step that we take is giving generously. And we just know that when we trust God with our finances, we give him room to work. And practically, when you give generously to Prairie Lakes Church, you partner with us in changing lives across Iowa and beyond. So if you wanna take that step, whether it's for the very first time or increasing in your generosity, uh, you can go to our website at prairielakes.org forward slash give and select your campus from the drop down. But hey, we're gonna continue in our What If Jesus Was Serious series. So we're gonna hear from Pastor Jesse, but before we do, I'm gonna read today's passage. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you that they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans for they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Church, glad that you're here on this beautiful uh, fall weekend because the weather's changing, fall temps are coming, and for me what that means is some good time out in the woods in a tree stand with a bow. Um, so just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was up at our, on our farm in our timber and I was doing some maintenance of our trails, and we've got about three north-south trails that cut through our, our woods that we just keep clear of tree and debris and do a little bit of mowing of the underbrush. So I'm up there, I'm in one of our ATVs, I've got the mower going on behind me and I'm gonna clear out the trail that's furthest west. So we've got this trail that goes east and west over the northern boundary of our property then it bends around on the Wapsipinikin River which runs through, it bends around and kind of follows that south. Um, and right at that bend, <laughs> right at that bend, the trail is actually pretty easy to lose. And here's why. Uh, the Wapsie, whenever it floods, which it does frequently, it can deposit a bunch of debris and deadfall and whatever is coming down the river to the point where you can't really tell when it recedes. You can't really tell where the trail was. 
And uh, there's been plenty of times where I've been walking on it before sunrise, you know, in the dark and thinking I was on the trail, um, walked for like t- 10 minutes until I realized I am not on the trail. Uh, where I am is in the middle of the woods in the dark. So I'm up there, it's the middle of the afternoon, uh, sun shining, mows churning behind me, and I get to that, that bend in the south, and so I stop, and I'm trying to look at where this trail is really supposed to be, and I, I pick up a reference point um, where I think it is, like 20 yards in front of me, and I pick up another one at like 40, and then another one at 60. In other words, I think I can, I think I can see where it should be. I think I, I can see it, and, and sure enough, the river had deposited some deadfall and other brush and junk that I was gonna need to clear out, which is why I was up there in the first place. So I'm going and I get to the first deadfall and I grab the chainsaw and I start chopping it up and dragging it out of the way and get back into the ATV, fire up the mower, keep going. I do this for like 50 yards, okay? And, and, and then what happens is I come up on another deadfall that, uh, that had obviously been there in that exact spot for like, I don't know, 10 years, right? Like it'd been there for, <laughs> for a long time, which means this is not the trail. This isn't the trail. What this is starting to be though is a brand new trail uh, that I'm creating that leads to absolutely nowhere um, in the middle of the woods. And it's just burning up a lot of gas on the saw and a lot of battery in the ATV. So I gotta work back all the way back to where I think I may have gotten off track. I gotta find the right reference point now in that bend to get me connected with the real trail that goes south. So. There's the story, here's the thing, here's the thing. It's easy to get off track. It is, it's just easy to get off track even when you think you're headed in the right direction. (laughs) It is, now maybe not for you, maybe you know where you're going all the time. For me, it feels like that. I mean, I stopped and looked for a while, like for longer than I care to admit. (laughs) you as I've told this story, I stopped and looked, I did. Like I, I, I had been there more times than I can remember. I'd even made that mistake before. And I thought I picked out the right reference point. And yet, now there's this you know, freshly cut trail in those woods that's really gonna mess with the next person who follows it, probably me. Um, so that's true. Now here's what also is true. Um, it's not only easy to get off track, you're guaranteed to get off track when you pick the wrong reference points. That's a guarantee. Um, you know, for me, I picked out a few trees that looked like they had the, the right gaps between them and kind of looked like a trail, you know, kind of looked like the right direction, but no. And uh, the further I went, the clearer I became, clearer it became, I, I, just, I just picked the wrong reference points. Um, so listen, this weekend as we uh, continue in our What If Jesus Was Serious series, um, we're going to get to a part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he teaches his disciples how to pray uh, with a prayer that's become known now as the Lord's Prayer. That's the part of the sermon we're getting into. And uh, some of you may have grown up in a church where you said the Lord's Prayer weekly. A lot of us are familiar with it, but what you may not be as familiar with is the context of the Lord's Prayer. In other words, like, what did Jesus say right before it um, right before he taught it to his disciples, because there was, a, there was a reason he felt like he needed to teach them this prayer. There was a reason. And if we can catch on to that reason in the context, I think we're going to better understand the Lord's Prayer itself. So here's the context, and we're going to be in Matthew 6, by the way. So if you've got your Bibles, get ready to go there. We'll have some of the verses on the screen as well. But um, here's the reason that Jesus feels like he's got to teach his disciples how to pray. I want you to take a look at this passage from um, Matthew 6, now verse 1. He says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So there's the statement Jesus makes. There's the headline. There's the beginning of the backdrop of the context of the reason why he's going to teach his disciples how to pray. That's what he says. And so just so we don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying here, um, Jesus is not saying that doing good things in front of people is always bad. That's not what he's saying. It's not like he's saying, hey, only secret good behavior. If you're going to be good, make sure nobody sees. The only time it's okay to do what's right is when no one else is watching, you know? And, and then you should feel bad whenever you get praise from someone for, for doing what's right. That's not, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. Hey, there's a bunch of people out there who make sure that they do the right thing in the most visible of ways. There's people like that. And, and the reason those people do that 
is so that they'll get everyone else's approval, right? That's because that's who they really are on the inside. That's, and that's what they're really after. And, and don't be like them, Jesus is saying. Hey, your father in heaven, uh, he's not a big fan of those kinds of people. They're, they're bad reference points, in other words. Um, and this was what was going on in Jesus' day. I mean, there were a bunch of people who kind of set themselves up as examples to follow, as examples of good and, and godly people, models of what a godly person was supposed to be like, who Jesus, who Jesus says in reality are not good models at all. And then Jesus proceeds to give some examples just so everybody knows who he's talking about. So in 6.2, Matthew 6.2, he says, so, hey, listen, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in, in full. So, so, so what's, he, what's he talking about here? I mean, people are giving their offering in church or they're giving some cash to a beggar on the street and there's like a mariachi band that fires up, you know? No, it's, well, it's, it's unclear um, if Jesus is talking literally here, um, like, like actual trumpet blast, or if he's talking metaphorically here, like, hey, when you give, don't blow your own horn. Um, some scholars even think that he might be referring to people clanging their coins in the offering plate or in the beggar's cup, you know, like a, like a sound like that, you know? But either way, here's what Jesus is saying. Those people are giving in a way, deliberately, that wins them tons of approval um, and, and then wins them tons of admiration from everybody else around them. And in fact, that's exactly why they're doing it. And, and therefore, they're, bad, they're just a bad reference point. You don't, you don't want to be like those people. I know that everyone else looks at them and, and, and wants to be like them. I know that everyone else is, quote, amazed at their generosity and that they're the standard for what we hope to be one day. But you got to watch out, Jesus says, if you use them as, as your reference point and you strive to be more like them, you're going to get way off track way off track from who God wants you to be. And then similarly, Jesus in Matthew 6, 5, he says, hey, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. I tell you, truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full. So same, same, same pattern here, like right? everyone thinks these professional prayers <laughs> are so great and so holy and so godly. But Jesus, they're a bad reference point. Like they're doing it to one another's approval. And, 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 and notice this. And maybe you did, right? Jesus calls both types of people in these examples what? I mean, he calls them hypocrites. Hypocrites. Why, now, why are they hypocrites? Well, let's remember what our definition, what a good definition of a hypocrite is, first of all. What's a hypocrite? Well, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite. Uh, when who I am on the outside doesn't match up with who I am on the inside. That's what a hypocrite is. We know that. And this is probably how most of us would define it. Um, a hypocrite is someone whose outside doesn't match up with the inside. It's someone who kind of leads a double life, you know? And then if we had to come up with an example of a hypocrite, a lot of us would just point to, like, the most recent scandal. Um, you know, whichever high-profile politician or business leader or even pastor or religious leader whichever one of them just got exposed for doing the very thing they were telling everybody else not to do. That's a hypocrite. But, but and it is, it is, but, but Jesus' example um, aren't really those, are they? I mean, that really scandals. That's not who he's talking about. His examples are a little bit different. And it's important that we kind of see this difference, that this kind of hypocrisy here, we're going to miss the power of what Jesus is pointing out. See, according to Jesus... You know, a hypocrite also, really, is when what I'm doing is good, but why I'm doing it isn't. When, when what I'm doing on the outside is good, but why I'm doing that isn't. Or when I'm doing the right thing for the wrong reason or, this, or a selfish reason. That's the kind of hypocrites that Jesus is, is talking about. See, see anybody, can, <laughs> anybody can pick up on a hypocrite once their hypocrisy is made public, you know, and as it hits the headlines, well, wow, what a horribly hypocritical person, you know. Glad I'm not like that. But uh, I think it hits a little closer to home when you consider that Jesus' examples of hypocrites weren't 
you know, these people who are living some sort of secretly horrible life while enjoying fame and fortune in the public eye. No, Jesus' examples were people doing the right thing. They were just doing it for the wrong reasons. They were doing it for motives that were, were selfish, and, but, but, but hidden. See, it's people who were giving charitably, and they were giving charitably in a way that was a huge blessing to others, that was making a huge impact. That's what they were doing. It, it, it's people who prayed and they preached in a way that, that the crowds just loved to hear. That's what they were doing. But, but those people weren't giving because they were generous people, and they weren't praying or preaching because they had this deep and abiding desire, this genuine desire for others to know God in the way that they did. That's not why they were doing it. And the reason that's not why they were doing it is because that's not who they were on the inside. That's not, that's not why they were doing what they were doing. Their motives were selfish. They wanted to win the approval of others. And that, Jesus says, that's the kind of hypocrisy that you really got to be on the lookout for. Why? Well, you got to be on the lookout for that kind of hypocrisy because it's pretty easy to get led astray by those kinds of hypocrites. And it's easy to get led astray by those kind of hypocrites because a lot of times everybody loves them. Everybody loves them. Or large groups of people do, right? They, they love them for what they say or what they do or what they stand for or how gifted they are or what kind of impact they're making, you know. On the surface, they look like a great reference point but they're not because all too often below the surface they're doing or saying the right thing for the wrong reason and then eventually what happens you know when the stuff on the inside of someone isn't good when someone's doing what they're doing or saying what they're saying primarily for selfish reasons usually to win the approval of others in our day and age, it's to sell books or it's to get views or it's to get downloads or subscribers or votes or influence or cloud or whatever it is. Eventually, those people become blind guides. Pied Pipers even. Leading masses of people off the cliff as they chase after not what they're saying, but after their sense of approval popularity, power, control. People who do the right thing for the wrong reasons, Jesus is saying they're bad reference points. They're dangerous examples to follow. That's what he's saying. And as we think about that, uh, I, I, I can't help but continue to reflect on these last 18 months. I mean, it was, it was March of 2020. In fact, March 8 was my birthday in 2020. It was the same day that COVID hit the headlines, which is great. It's a great memory I've got now. Um, but the thing I can't help but reflect on is, is, is how many just plain bad reference points there have been in the last 18 months. Just a lot of really bad reference points. How, and, and, then, and then how so many, so many of us got lost chasing after or following after these. We, and, and, we, and we thought, we thought, that the, the, they were good reference points. We, we thought we were headed in the right direction and it turns out not so great, right? So many bad reference points. And, and, and so here's what it feels like for me as a pastor recently, and, and I, I've said this to more than a, a few people over these last few weeks. Here's what it feels like. It feels like right now, it feels like I'm in, I'm in a rescue raft. A rescue raft. Like our ship got torpedoed. <laughs> We all had to bail, <laughs> and, and we've been just kind of scrambling to, to find the survivors who've, uh, who've drifted out to sea. You know, we've been drifting for the last 18 months, battered first by the pandemic, and then masks, and then racial upheaval, and then a derecho. We had a derecho. We had a derecho, okay? <laughs> and, then, and, we, and then there was this election, and then January 6th, and the vaccine, and mandates, and supply chain, and labor shortages, and Afghanistan, and all of it, all of it, right? That's where we've been drifting. But, but now there's starting to be these moments, for me anyways, there's these moments where I've been able to reconnect with people, sometimes for the first time in a long time. And we get to a point in the conversation where they share something with me. And here's, here's, here's what they say that causes me to realize, oh, I'm in a life raft and I'm, 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 I'm reaching down to someone and I need to pull them in. Here's, here's what they say. 
they'll say to me, hey, I, I didn't think I... I didn't think I'd ever be so disappointed and disillusioned with people who I really respected. People who I thought were solid followers of Jesus, people who I had a good relationship with, for, for sometimes for years, um, who I listened to and who I, who I trusted, and uh, who just went nuts. And, uh, and they went nuts because they followed some pretty horrible reference points. Um, they followed someone or a group of someone's down a path that, that maybe looked like the right one at first, but it, it, it led to nowhere good. And it's like, hey, I... Me too. Come on in. It's been a pretty disorienting time. See, it's disorienting when you discover that someone who you thought was good and a trustworthy example turned out not to be. It's disorienting. It's disorienting when it's difficult to really know who to believe or what to believe. That's disorienting. It's disorienting when some of the people that you trusted and even knew and loved most in the world, it's disorienting when you see them lead themselves or or lead others down a path that you don't think you can or, or even should follow. It's just, it is, it's disorienting. And so this, my friends, this is why, this is why Jesus taught his disciples to pray this prayer. That's the context, that's the backdrop, that's the reason. Because the same thing that's true in our world today, it was true in his world back then. I mean, there were plenty of people setting themselves up to be examples of who to follow who were not really good examples. And so once Jesus paints this picture, what he does is he gives them this prayer. And in this prayer, he gives them some much better reference points. In fact, if you're taking notes, here's the heading, okay? There's some reliable reference points in the Lord's Prayer. There's some reliable reference points in the Lord's Prayer. So what we're going to do, we're just going to walk down as we close here, start to close, walk down Jesus' prayer now that we understand why he gave it to his disciples. Because there's some things in here that are just great reference points, really relevant reference points, things, things that we should be on the lookout for uh, in ourselves and in others, that if we were to dig below the surface of our own lives or, or see below the surface in someone else's life um, who, who set themselves up as examples, here's what we should expect to find. If they're, good reference, if they're good reference points, if they're, if they're people that we can really kind of follow and, and, and put our trust in and rest our lives on and, 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 and take steps towards, right? Here's what we should find. It should be aligned with these things that Jesus says in the prayer, okay? Strive to be people who are like this. Follow people who are like this. Let's start reading together now in verse 9 of chapter 6. Matthew 6, 9. Here's what Jesus, how he opens up his prayer. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's where he starts. Hallowed, hallowed. Is a, it's respected, it's revered. You know, that's what that word means. So, so in light of that, here's reliable reference point number one. Reliable reference points inspire more awe of God than them. That's a reliable reference point, okay? Those people, they inspire more awe in you of God than all of them. And it's the first thing in Jesus' prayer because it's the most important it is. And everything else that Jesus prays flows out of and is connected to it. People who are reliable reference points are the kind of people who absolutely are inspiring for sure, but they inspire more awe of God, of who God is, of what God has done, of what he is doing, of what he can do, of what life with God is like, you know? Way more, way more awe in God, of God, than in who they are, of who they are, of what they've done, or what they're going to do next. That's, that's the most important. That's the first question. Hey, do I, do I have more admiration of them or God? Number one, let's go to the next verse. Okay, let's get to number two. Matthew 6, 10, Jesus goes on to pray, your kingdom come, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom, God, meaning your rule, your reign, your ways. What, what life in society here on this earth would be like if you were fully in charge of it. 
And not, not just in heaven someday, Jesus is saying, pray, pray, like, like, like the earth will, will be more like heaven, like the earth here and now will be more like heaven. So, so here's your reliable reference point. Number two, people who are reliable reference points are hopeful. <laughs> but in a, in, a, in a very specific way, they're hopeful, not in the world, but they're hopeful about God in the world. Which, which follows from number one. Like if I'm absolutely in awe of who God is, of what God can do, of what he is doing, of what he will, if I'm absolutely in awe of God, then I have absolutely every reason to be hopeful and optimistic about the world that I live in because I know God desires to save it. I know God desires to redeem it. I know God desires to fix it. I know he loves it. And I know he will rule over it. Which isn't to say that we got to be hopeful and optimistic about everything in this world, <laughs> right? Like, we're not Pollyanna people. We're not rose-colored glasses, always look on the bright side, you know, ignorance is bliss kind of people. No, of course not. Because those people aren't reliable either, are they? You know, they refuse to see the really screwed up things that are going on. But you know who else isn't reliable? Those doomsday conspiracy theorists. This world is going to hell in a handbasket kind of people either. They're not reliable either, right? And there's a whole lot of them these days. And the reason there's a whole lot of them these days is that with every new crisis, there's an opportunity for those kinds of people. Every new crisis, they gain a larger following and they claim to be speaking in the name of God, whether it's biblical prophecy or this current event headline and how it relates to Daniel or some sort of new insight into Revelation that for some reason nobody ever knew before, whatever it is. Like those people are not reliable. You want to know why they're not reliable? You know why you'd be suspicious of them? It's because Jesus doesn't pray the kind of prayer that says, look out! Hold up until it's all over. God's going to be completely absent from this world and leave you high and dry until I come back. <laughs> Good luck, suckers. You know, like that's not what he prays. No, Jesus says God's going to intervene more. Pray for him to intervene more. You know, that this world here and now, the one you and I live in here and now, will look more like heaven. More like the place where God is in completely in charge. Man, be hopeful people. <laughs> Not hopeful in the world, but about God in it. Not because of the world, but because of the God who is in charge of it. Number two, next one's in 611, Matthew 611. Jesus says, give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Here's your reference point. Reliable reference points are people who are more dependent and less independent, okay? Here's what I mean. So reliable reference points, those are people that find their freedom, their identity, their well-being, their hope, their future, their peace, all of it. They find it in their dependence on God. The more dependent they are on God, the more confident and at peace they are about everything. <laughs> the more dependent they are on God, the more steadfast and secure they are about everything. More dependence, more dependence, right? There are so many unreliable reference points who tell you that your identity, your freedom, your well-being, or even your faith rests not on your dependence of God, and not on your dependence on God, but on your independence, right? On being free from whatever threat is out there to your religious freedom or to your Christian values or to belief or your foundation, right? No. No. Nope. Not true. None of those things are dependent on anything. On anything else. But the God we serve your whole being rests on God being good and providing for your every need, your daily bread. And he can and he will do that no matter what we face next. Stop following people who tell you to protect your independence at all costs. They are not good reference points. They're not. Start following people who tell you to be dependent upon God at all costs. Follow those people, right? Those are great reference points. <laughs> Next one, 
can be found in Matthew 6, 12 in the prayer. Here's what Jesus says. He says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So here's your reference point, number four. Reliable reference points, they know they've been forgiven much. And so they easily forgive others. They know they've been forgiven much. And so they easily forgive others. Let me tell you this, okay? Whenever I see someone, especially in the public eye, get up on a soapbox, and they just start railing away at something, you know, or someone. Even if they're right, okay? Even if I agree with them. Whenever I see a person do that, I, I just, I can't help but wonder this. Hey, have you forgotten how messed up you are? You know, like, or if they're a follower of Jesus, have you, have you forgotten how justified God would have been to just write you off, but he didn't? I mean, do you have any kind of awareness of how, of just how much you've been forgiven as you get after someone for who they are and what they're doing? Even if I agree with them, even if I think they're right. See, reliable reference points usually aren't the loudest voice around the table or on the internet. Because here's what they know. They know, they know just how much God forgave them. And it's hard for them to climb up on that soapbox and shout down to others when they know Jesus climbed up on a cross for them. And so their posture, their, 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 their default towards others, their default way of relating, of listening, of talking, of whatever, right? Their default tends to be much more forgiving than it is condemning. Much more open than it is confrontational. or angry, or vitriolic. Here's, here's the last one, okay? From, from verse 13, as Jesus ends his prayer, he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, okay? Number five, here's your, here's your reliable reference point. Reliable reference points are, they're aware of just how fragile their integrity is. You know, they know that there's, there's only one true hero in this story. There's only one. There's only one guy who's completely and utterly reliable all the time, who's, whose integrity is unquestionable and impeccable. There's only one guy that you can always count on, whose life matches up on the outside and inside. There's only one guy, and they're not him. That, that, that man is Jesus, right? Reliable reference points know that the only guy who fits that description is Jesus. You know what unreliable reference points do? They demand that you trust them. They, 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 they are confident that their viewpoint is always the right one and that you, you can and maybe even should have absolute confidence in them. But here's what reliable reference points know. We, we know we're, we're just, we're fragile. We're fragile because we're tempted. We're tempted because on the inside of us still is there's a sin thing. And, and, and because of that, there's nothing that ultimately we're not capable of. And we know it. And we know that because of that, all of us are just one step away from screwing it all up. And that's a pretty humbling place to be. But it's our ongoing reality. And so reliable reference points will tell you, hey, put your confidence in God, not me. That's what a reliable reference point will do. Hey, listen, um, this is the Lord's Prayer this week. The, the, the book, as, as we're reading it, calls the section the prayer for losers. <laughs> and the reason it's going to call us that is because a lot of these reference points in our culture today, they just don't make sense. People that chase after them are sometimes seen as, as losers. Listen. I'd love to be a loser. I'd love more losers. Love more losers to be worshiping at Prey Lakes. Because here's what we know. If we follow these reference points, if we chase after people, we become like people that Jesus describes in his prayer. We're headed in the right direction. Thanks for that message, Pastor Jesse. And if you are hearing that and you have questions and maybe how to apply that, 
uh, or if you just want to pray with someone, we have people ready right now here in this moment to do just that. If you are on Church Online, you can hit the live prayer button. If you are on social media, you can send us a message and we would love to be there for you. And kids, uh, don't run off just yet. In just one minute, children's programming is going to begin. So get ready for that. But everyone else, it was so good to be with you here today. We'll see you back next week. Grace, I built this really tall tower, but there's one problem, it's in my way. And you look super strong, so I'm gonna need you to knock this down. Is that something you can do? Yeah? Mm -hmm. A little louder. Yeah! Okay, I, I'm confident you can knock this down. All right, ready? On three, you're gonna run through and push it over. All right? One, two, three. <laughs> Job. Parents, if you go to prairielakeschurch.org backslash children, you can find many activities just like this one to do with your kids. So take a look at that as we jump into this week's videos.
and finally the gummy fish. That's individuality for you. Individuality is discovering who you're meant to be so you can make a difference. Here's one thing I've discovered about myself. I have a very special gift. I'm kind of an expert at finding the perfect candy combinations. For instance, everyone knows that chocolate and peanut butter goes well together. But did you know that sour worms and cherry starburst together will make your head spin? <laughs> but my most favorite combination is the one I'm working on right now. I start with sour candy. Oh, I love it so much. But too much sour can be a bad thing. So to balance it out, chocolate covered raisins. <laughs> they take some of the punch out of the sour. And plus, they used to be grapes, so healthy. Then the gummy fish. Of course, these are key because they stick to your teeth so you know you'll be tasting them for at least another hour. You see that? <laughs> I used my gift of candy combining to really make a difference in my life. Now I have all these perfect little bags that I can enjoy for weeks to come. <laughs> or at least a couple of days. I'm going to eat so much candy, so, so, so much candy. <laughs> I wonder if there's a better way for me to use my gift. One that won't make me sick or cost me a fortune at the dentist. You know, our story today is about a woman named Lydia. She had a very special gift too, and we're going to learn how she used it. So, so, so much candy. <laughs> I'll see you soon. The Bible. It's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Acts. Chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. Lydia of Thyatira was a remarkable woman. Her city was known for its craftsmen, especially those who made and sold expensive purple dye. Take a look. I use only the finest snail shells. Though most successful people in business were men, Lydia learned the craft of purple dye. And when she traveled to the Roman city of Philippi, she set up a business selling rare, expensive purple cloth. Please note, we have lilac, plum, iris, lavender, and grape fabric laid out. And over here, you'll find amethyst, eggplant, and orchid. Lydia had likely been raised to believe in many false gods, but in her heart, she knew there was something more. The Jewish people believe in just one god. What if they're right? The city of Philippi had laws against bringing any unknown religion into the city but Lydia would meet outside the city gates on the riverbank with a group of women who believed in the one true God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Love him with all your strength. Lydia and the other women had never heard of Jesus, but as they began to seek God together, God sent a vision to someone else, the apostle Paul, who was staying in the Greek city of Troas. Dream. It was so vivid. I saw a man standing right here begging me. He said, come over to Macedonia, help us. Immediately, Paul and his friends set sail. Within a few days, they reached land and traveled to Philippi, one of the most important cities in Macedonia. So we just start by finding a synagogue of Jewish believers, right? I don't think there is a synagogue here. On the Sabbath, a day of worship, Paul and his friends went down to the river, hoping to find a place of prayer. Shall we gather at the river? Um, excuse me. Hi there. Do you wish to join us? We're praying to the one true God. Absolutely. There, by the river, Paul told the story of Jesus and how anyone who chose to follow Jesus could have a relationship with God that lasts forever. But. 
This is amazing. This changes everything. The Lord opened Lydia's heart to believe every word of Paul's message. I wish to be baptized at once. Not only was Lydia baptized, but she immediately shared the good news with her family and everyone who lived and worked in her home. And they too were baptized. Lydia gathered Paul and his friends. Do you consider me a believer in the Lord? If you do, come and stay at my house. We would be honored. As a successful businesswoman, Lydia's house was likely large and beautiful. We must meet here from now on. Lydia did not hesitate to give everything she had to the believers in the brand new church. And when Paul and Silas were later thrown in prison and then released, they immediately returned to Lydia's home to rest and prepare before they left the city. You must be brave. Of course we will. Don't forget to write. Later, Paul did write a letter to Lydia and others in the Church of Philippi, and he remembered his time spent in Lydia's home in the church there with great joy. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. I'm happy because you have joined me in spreading the good news. God began a good work in you, and I am sure that he will carry it on until it is completed. In everything she did, Lydia continued to use her gifts to help others. Okay, so everyone has at least one gift, right? Something they can do really well. And it doesn't have to be something flashy, like being an amazing singer. You could be good at baking, swimming, finding things that are lost, talking very, 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 very fast, making people laugh identifying different species of birds. Uh, it's a, a blue-throated macaw. Lydia's gift was that she was good at business. She knew how to make money by selling things that people wanted. She sold purple cloth. I wonder if she sold a coat like this. Probably not. Whether you know it or not, you have a gift. You may even have more than one, but what your gifts are isn't as important as how you use them. Lydia used the money she made in her business to provide a place to stay for the Apostle Paul and his friends. She used her gifts to help others. And Jesus was constantly teaching people, healing people and loving people. He used his gifts to help others too. That's what we should do. When we're good at something, we shouldn't just use it to help ourselves or to make ourselves look good. God gave us our gifts and we should share them with other people. That's the one thing to remember today. Use your gifts to help others. So I think I'm gonna share these bags of candy instead of keeping them all to myself. And not only that, I bet I can use my gift to help other people find their favorite candy combinations. I could go into business like Lydia. Whew. This idea is making my head spin. I'll see you next time. Now, what candy goes well with chicka sticks? Thank you.